It also takes a protector talk. What we're going to do today, and we're going to start out and kind of define what true manhood is. We're going to talk about the silveric code, and then we're going to get into a little brief touch on demonology, because we have to know who our enemy is. And then we're going to get into what are we going to do about it. I'm going to give you some tactics and some very powerful uh, spiritual routines that we can do to help carry that mission out. Um, just give them a little bit of my background. I'm in a prayer group of sports exorcists in their ministries. And through some things God has allowed me to experience for, for years, I've been able to help other people. I work with uh, numerous uh, sexual assault victims, uh, both or, and physical, uh, mental health issues, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar. Um, I've actually worked with people in the occult who make blood packs with But once you get in the occult, they, demons aren't going to let you go easily. So, and dealing with all that. So I, I've been able to see, I've seen uh, actually physical manifestations of demons countless times. So when, when evil manifests before your face, it's a whole different reality to our faith. You know, it's, it's very rare, but we, we know that our faith tells us there's angels and demons. But when you see something manifest before you, that's a whole another level. And there might be, I'm sure there's quite a number of guys in here who have had some kind of experiences like that. So we're getting into that a little bit. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a theologian, I'm not a doctor of theology. What I'm going to give you is comes from Father Chad Ripperger. He's a practicing exorcist, done thousands of exorcisms. He, was a, he taught at the uh, fraternity se uh, seminary for a number of years. He's a, uh, he also, this is a big part, he has a PhD in psychology. So he's reached the highest level of academia in, in mental health. Okay? And he's a practicing exorcist. So a lot of people say, oh, it's, it's not demonic, it's just, you know, mental health issues, or... No, he knows both, okay? He knows what's <laughs> demonic and what's true mental health issues, okay? So what I'm going to give you from that perspective is, is basically regurgitating some of his talk. So this is not my, not my theology, and, okay. so just to clarify that. <clears throat> what I'm going to give you today in the spiritual realm is that equivalent, okay? So you will know more than probably like 99% of Catholics when you walk out of here today. How many of you ever see the, the sacrament of confirmation? Raise your hand. Okay, congratulations, guys. You are soldiers of Christ. You, have, you don't have a choice in this matter. Okay? So now we're going to give you the proper education and know how to carry that out. And that's our duty. Okay? So one of the things that really helped me, which is why I was telling some guys, you know, I, I've never had to kill anybody. I'm probably never going to have to my whole life. But I trained very vigorously, very intensely. Because that actually married, uh, mirrors the, the, in the military sense, as far as like the special forces, the, the dedication they do when they go through hell week, you know, sleep deprived for like three days, just pushing you to the utmost limit, mentally, physically, uh, just to gauge a, a corporal uh, enemy, okay? We're dealing with the demonic. Our enemies never sleep. They know every single sin that you've done, they know your, your chemistry, your, your physiology. They know your personality better than you will ever know it. They're a whole different species. They're, they're angelic. And they're, they're basically just intellect and will. Okay? And they have dominion over, over the created worlds. Okay? So they can manifest. They can move objects. They can instantly... My priest said, if God let a demon, he, one demon has the power to collapse the whole universe. What? <clears throat> yes. So obviously God puts all these constraints on what the roles are and what they can and can't do. That's how powerful these entities are, okay? So, it's like, it's like t taking a soldier or giving him a bunch of weapons, but, but now with no ammo, and he's walking down the middle of Baghdad, and there's snipers, enemy snipers all around. How do you think he's gonna last in the spiritual warfare? Right, not very long. But average, the, the average Catholic doesn't know these things. Why do you think the church is failing so much? Exorcism, exorcism will tell you, it takes on average two to three years to get rid of, some, to get full healing for something that's fully possessed when it took maybe about a year, years ago. It's because the church isn't praying anymore. We're not fasting, we're not doing penance, right? We don't pray. In our temple rosary we do, we actually pray with the first line with our arms extended. And we go back to Moses, right? When the arms come down, they lost the battle. Guys, we've got to get in the fight, okay? You've got to take it seriously. You've got to turn that stupid TV off, right? <laughs> We gotta get engaged, we gotta get trained, and we have to have this warrior mindset. Just like those special forces, the, 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 the amount of training they do is such a heroic level on a natural level. We need to do that in the spiritual realm. Okay, that's our duty and our calling. And even, 
even if you're not doing stuff like I do, if you're a father in your home, we're going to talk about our duties, that's your responsibility to put that house on lockdown, to keep the enemies out from all areas of your children's life. That's what you'd be accountable to God you, at your judgment. He is giving us our children on loan, and he expects those children back when they die to be with him forever. Woe to you if that child is lost through your, through your fault. Okay. Now, just to kind of give you a little mirror, mirroring the, the, the physical, the military style with the spiritual life. Obviously, they're very disciplined, right? They take these cocky kids, they put them in boot camp, they break them down, they beat them up, and they train them into, into fight, uh, fierce fighting warriors. Okay? That discipline is so important. And we're going to talk a little bit later about our rule of life, being accountable, having that daily regimen that we do, that we stick to. Okay? Uh, and we can do this through mortification. That's basically how we build big spiritual muscles. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the talk. Obedience is so critical. You can't just have a, a mission and just have guys run around and do what they want to do. People die. Okay? So, in our role is the Ten Commandments. The moral law that we have to hold by. Mortal sin is the gateway to the demonic. Okay? But when you do mortal sin, you say, God, I don't want you. You open, the, you open up that, those gates for the demons to come and to fully possess you for one mortal sin. Now, fortunately, out of God's mercy, it's very rare that he lets a full possession come in. Okay? Out of his mercy, that normally doesn't happen. But you will get, they basically have, they own your soul until you go to confession. This is serious stuff, guys. Right? Today, they don't even talk about mortal sin anymore. They don't even, a lot of priests don't even believe in, 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 in hell. Right? So, we have to be, we, we, have to, we need a wake-up call. We need to go through that boot camp. To wake us up to the reality of evil and what our responsibilities are. Fortitude. You know, those guys that they sit, the Navy SEALs will sit and wave with the link arms at night in the cold, freezing water, and they hustle the waves, pound them in the face for hours. Oh, that's just brutal, oh. right? Sleep deprivation for three days, beyond your mental uh, capacity. Um, that, the, the natural fortitude, we need to have a spiritual fortitude when it comes to temptations, holding our ground when we're tempted. Now, God will let us, depending on our... On, how, on your spiritual path and where God wants you and what he's called you to do, some people will get more fierce temptations than others. And what, what that level is, we all experience temptations. We're all, we're all required to maintain a course. And we're going to give you some tools to do that. This, this is a big one. It was just uh, Mark's uh, retreat that Kingsman has been so great on. is camaraderie. Okay? Most guys don't go in the military anymore. They don't really have that true brotherhood. You know, like you said, Mark, you only have really two guys that know you inside and out that you can trust with your life, right? So that's something that's so lacking today in our culture. Satan, the demons will do this. They will isolate you, okay? <clears throat> they want you cut off. Like, obviously, this is very uh, a kind of empowering uh, fellowship that we're doing at this retreat, okay? It strengthens us. Maybe we kind of got off the rails, and now we're like, hey, man, I need to shape up and focus. And so man, iron sharpens iron is so critical, okay? You have, to have, you have to have this camaraderie, this fraternity is so important. So... This is very important in your spiritual life, of some form. Okay, you don't have to come to this re particular retreat. You need to have at least some buddies that, in your church or faith community, of men of faith, that are willing to hold you guys accountable, but also guys you can trust with your life, all the deep secrets or whatever you're struggling with that you can be open with. That's so critical in the military. It's a bond. I'm not, I was never in the military, but I told the guys that this it's just a bond you, you never really have again. There's literally guys who have been discharged from a number of missions overseas. They want to go back. If they get hurt, like, send me in. I need to get back to my guys, my troops. The bond is so strong. They want to get back in that battle again because of that fraternity. It's so powerful. And, you know, so some of us have, have father issues, right? This is a great way. And if you, if you can have an older mentor that can maybe help, help, feel, help heal some of that wound, a guy that can really trust. Older guys, you have a lot of life experiences. Mentor the young ones, okay? Use that experience and knowledge that you have and to foster that. Something that God's really revealed to me in a, in a, just a number of months ago in, in defining what, what is our standard as being an ultimate protector and also as a Catholic man, okay? There's all this buzzwords to talk about Catholic masculinity, authentic Catholic, Catholic masculinity, but I don't think, if I, if I had a poll and I wrote it down and we collected all the answers, we're going to get a whole wide range of what that means, okay? So, the person God's revealing to me is that the ultimate call is knighthood. 
and I'm talking about the Catholic version of knighthood, okay? And we're going to define that in the silver code. So, the ultimate sacrifice is to shed your blood for the faith, right? All right so there's no greater gift than to give your life, lay your life down for your friends. That's the ultimate calling. We talked about, we did stuff on the range. Guys are willing to jump in when everybody's running out to save life. That's the ultimate call of manhood. And you're, <clears throat> today we actually, in this, this retreat, you're actually in the presence of two actual knights, authentic knights of the faith. Uh, Sir Matt, will you please stand? He was knighted into the equestrian order of the Holy Sepulcher. So those are actually an outgrowth of the Knights Templar, which are designed to protect the temple. So he had to get recommended, only like, usually it's done by either by a bishop, you have to get approval. It's not something, hey, let me, I want to join up. It's not like the Knights of Columbus. This is actually the, the true knighthood. Uh, he's actually taken a vow of chivalry, and we're going to find what the silver code is. So this is, this is very, very serious. It's even, it's so rare these days, most people don't even know, I, including myself, didn't even know about this stuff until about like six months ago, okay? I, God's telling me, like, we need to bring this back. We need to set an ideal for these young ones. How do we train them to be fighters for the faith? And even our, any of our daughters. It's going to get so bad. One of our priests said that in the end times, unless you have a sacrament of con, uh, confirmation, you most likely will not keep your faith. That's all trying is going to get. Or think if you're living in China right now. The underground church is getting pummeled. They're in fear for their lives. Love them don't even get mass. Okay, we're going to talk about the rosary and why that's so powerful. Um, so we need to have foster this, all this training is to foster this mental attitude, this fierceness to, for our faith and for our duties. To defend the faith, know the faith, and, if, and have to use the sword to bring about peace, if necessary. Um, I was actually for, just recently knighted into the sacred military Constantinian order of St. George. It goes all the way back to Constantine himself. These knights, it was formally recognized by a Byzant Byzantine emperor, later got... Uh, Got protection in front of some papal bulls from the Holy See, the cardinals assigned. So I have lineage that always goes all the way back. So some of these actual knights of this order went on to join the Knights Templar and fight. And like my, I've taken vows to chivalry, and I can't tell you how much strength uh, it's brought in my life, and the amount of virtue it's, it's helped to really focus on what my call. I really feel like I was remade when this when this knighting ceremony was done. I was really made at the cell cellular level. It's really hard to understand. It's so powerful. You don't have to be formally knighted like Matt and I. You can still subscribe to these ideals in your own spheres. Okay? Um, it's, just, it's very powerful. We need to bring this back. Uh, if you have pens, I have to take some notes. We're going to go into what the sobric code is. And what I want you to do is I go through, I'm going to give you some examples of what some of these are, and you do an inventory of where do I stand. Maybe you're really strong in this area, maybe you're failing. Because that's where you need to put some attention in. Okay? The first one is fidelity. That's faith and loyalty to God, number one. And the defend of the church and the natural law. Something that's really coming under attack these days. Guys, like, I, I was a uh, third degree Knights of Columbus, and we, I'm, I can't talk about what the, the, the actual rights are, but part of it is they, they catechize you, they test you on your faith. And this is the third degree, and the bishop was there to say, I'm, I'm, you guys are the leaders of the from the, in the lay perspective, you're supposed to be the leaders of the faith. They couldn't, these guys could not even tell you the Ten Commandments. One guy didn't even know who the Pope was. It was so embarrassing. And these are, this is the third degree. We're supposed to be the leaders, and we have no clue what our faith is. What are we fighting for? We have, there's no excuse before God because we're so blessed in this time where this eyesight is diabolical um, uh, confusion where. The face is being watered. We're, we're getting all these modernist things in the church. But God knows that, and he gave us the Internet. This is the one good thing about the Internet, is that I have access, we can, you have access to go back to all these pulse encyclicals, get to Council of Trent, uh, all these things with Theologica. There is no excuse. If you know the starting line of your football team and all the stats, and you don't know the Ten Commandments inside and out, you're not serving God. If you want to do a spiritual inventory, gentlemen, Count up all the numbers of hours for your free time. You're spent on the, the either social media, leisure, uh, watching TV. Not like I'm not spending good quality time like throwing football with your kids. Hey, that's what you should be doing. But if you take all this personal time, 
some of those hours and some of the hours you're doing stuff with God or for your the sacrament of matrimony, right? So, or how much time you spending with your kids? How much time you spend going to prayer, <coughs> spiritual reading? Sum all that up and, and weigh that, and we'll see where you're at. That's who you serve. Okay. Now I'm not saying leisure is good; it's actually a virtue in itself, but it has to be properly restrained and tempered. Okay. You can't just be on leisure all the time when you're not working and absent from your family. So loyalty to God, and also kind of mirrors the justice, what's due to God. Um, next one is honesty, integrity, doing the right thing at the right time. And where's Kanye? I want to touch on something he talked about, the girls, right? Yeah. This is something that is so misunderstood, what true masculinity is. Christ, we just had a little table discussion. Christ was bold. He called him out, you're a wolf. He threw tables in the temple. Mm-hmm. He had just anger. But Mary Magdalene, he was very compassionate, right? So you see this two, this compassionate Lord and this and this uh, warrior Lord, right? And what our priest said from regarding the on term of priest is that we, we need to be a lion from the pulpit and a lamb in the confessional. Mm-hmm. So how you balance masculinity, this we're accentuating this retreat. The, the, the extreme side of masculinity, right? We're doing all this good guy stuff, but but, but if you're always in that mode, that's that's disordered, right? Like so if you're drill sergeant with your family all the time, I struggle with this too because I'm very regimented and like, come on, let's go, we got to get this, and like I had to back off, I had to learn, like, hey, I'm too hard, like you know, I got to be compassionate, more tender with, with some of my with my daughters as well. So you can't be always in in uh, combat mode, okay? So. Uh, my girls like to do Scottish Highland dancing. They get a little the the kilts and their ballet shoes. Um, now I'm not I used to dance, but I was a fitness instructor and I used to do uh, fitness classes for their dancing. So all these little girls and they were doing some exercises, but they love it. They, and the other girls because their fathers don't come to see them dance. But I'm always there with them. I'm almost like a father figure. Some of these girls. So I'm always at all the I go to all the as much as I can with my job with vacation. I try to go to all these uh, dance competitions and I help the girls out. So. Yeah, I'm up there doing some <laughs> girl stuff, and they have the guy. Uh, the after the end, they, they try to raise money, so they have the guy, the adults, the guys try to go up and do these dances, and we make fools of ourselves. And so, but maybe next time. Uh, so you have to know when to be compassionate, and merciful, and when to be that warrior. If somebody breaks in your house, you better go commando. But you need to be. Ten- you you have to give your daughters. A physical affection, hug them, uh, kiss them, tell me they're beautiful. That's so. But so many girls have, have said that they, they really struggle with self, uh, self worth. They, they're concerned about their beauty and, and are they pretty? Yeah. All right, and they have such unrealistic standards in the media. As a father, the most best thing you can do if you want your daughter to have a healthy relationship and not marry a jerk is show that that she's valued and she's beautiful and she's loved. <clears throat> Even if she's not physically attractive, there's something beautiful about every, every female. Some gift that they have, some talent that they have, find that and accentuate that. So powerful. But that's being a leader. That's being masculine in a tender way. Just like when we open the doors for ladies, actually theoretically, because like, we're leaders, uh, we're leading women, theoretically, we should be going first to that doorway. But, but we don't. Because we're submitting our authority and opening it up for the weaker. Right? <clears throat> That, that's what chivalry is. So it's very important we understand when to be masculine and when not. Um, big one, keeping promises and oaths. That this is this is something that is really irks me. Is that when people say that I'm gonna, oh, I'll show up, I'll commit, I'll help you out, I'll be there to serve that day, and last minute, oh, sorry, I can't, I, I got to do something else. It's not important. It's not a great reason, okay? My day of medical emergency. Uh, all the, it's across the board, male, female. People just not keep their word anymore. If I say. I tell Mark, I'm going to commit to this. I'm committed. He's not to worry about, oh, I hope he's going to do this. He's going to check in. No, like, I'm on point. Okay? If I get my word in something, mm-hmm. I'm going to make sure I'm on time, too. Unless there's some, something outside of my circumstance that prevents me. I'm not going to be a minute. I'm always at least 15 minutes early. It's better to be an hour early and then a minute too late. Okay? Mm-hmm. Be prepared, gentlemen. Have this diligence. But honesty comes with, uh, as well as prudence. Doing the right thing at the right time. Actually, something uh, you may not know is workaholism, that's a sin of sloth. And you're like, what? <laughs> this doesn't make sense. 
You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing at the right time. Now, I understand that sometimes you have a project you're working on, or, or like, you know, my job, I have a, a, my work kind of goes like this hot, and then it goes like this, right? So there's some times in the first week of the month, I work a lot of overtime, but other than that, I'm out at five. I'm out the door at five every day. When I come home, there's no, uh, we don't have TV in our home. Uh, unless, I don't even use a cell phone unless it's an emergency, somebody calls me, anything personal, I do lunch hours, when I'm driving home, those are my office hours, when I'm driving home in the car. Uh, so when I shut off, I'm done. That's my duty, that's my, that's the most important thing I do. The thing is my, is matrimony and my responsibility for my, my, my beautiful wife and my, my children, okay? Doing the right thing at the right time. Next one's prowess or fortitude. Strength and courage, military skill, physical fitness. You guys, you have to, to, to have this warrior mindset, especially what we're gonna go through in the future, you have to train. To me, the, the psychology of man, if you're not fighting something, you're out of the game. You'll be fat and lazy. The, the psychology of men are geared to fight something. If you're not fighting for something, it doesn't have to be this thing. It's for our faith, or for our children, for the souls of our children. We need to fight for that, okay? If we're doing all this electronics or we're watching ESPN 24-7, you can't do it. Put some, do, do some, well, I asked some friends who do some stuff. We call it, did you do your 33s today? So it's just a, uh, and actually I have in our, one of the rules I talk about later, is we have to do 33 push-ups, 33 body weight squats, and 33 jumping jacks every day. If you want to do something more vigorous, then that suffices for that. But, and that's going to honor, honor the 33rd year in which our Lord sheds his blood for us. You have to have a spider mind. You have to be in shape. You have to discipline yourself. All, especially with electronics. It just kills guys. Parents, get your kids off those games. It, it will kill you. Like, especially for a man, and the, uh, the father talks about this, who's a, a psychologist. It actually, a lot of electronics will actually makes us effeminate. And when I mean by feminine, I'm not talking about girly or, or homosexual. I'm talking about effeminacy is an aversion to suffering. Oh. Okay? Food fast. Like, they're like, ugh. Like, <laughs> because it's hard, you know? There are different penances that we do, you know? You have to have this toughness. The guys in the military do it. They're, they're, they're forced to do it. But they do it. We need to do that on our own. It's hard because we don't have some drill instructor in our face. When you're doing long... That's why it's so important, important to have a disciplined life. And we'll get into that later. Uh, prowess is also unyielding courage in the face of adversity. Commitment is stronger than fear and pain, hardship, or even death. Guys, what are you willing to suffer for your family? Think about that. Is it not worth maybe a hard conversation with your wife and put some uh, filters on the on electronics and give her the passcode? Is it not worth not letting your, maybe your kids get upset because they can't do sleepovers or maybe they can't be with certain people because it, it, it's such a toxic uh, environment? Is it worth maybe not going on family vacation so you can homeschool? Or to send your kids to the wolves? Now understand... Now, not everybody can do that. Maybe there's, you know, a guy I work with, he's on permanent PTSD from the military. He can't work. His wife has to work. And they're just now coming into the faith, but they're going to try to start homeschooling. Or maybe, maybe there's, there's, there's certain valid ways, reasons that you, you can't homeschool. But if you have the means and you have two spouses working just to get a nice car, you're on the road to hell. I'm sorry, guys. This is your duty to return to God's chosen back to him. You have to do some tough decisions. Because of the time we live in, we actually have a duty um, to take them out of that environment the best we can. And that's some tough choices. Now, we do camping, right? It, it's cheap vacation. We're not going on $6,000 vacations. Our kids love camping. They still have to run around and get some freedom. Give us a good time, mom and dad, you know? You know, they'd be going on rides all the time and stuff. So we got to really do some hard choices. What are we willing to suffer for our family? Last one is generosity. Recon recognizing the needs of others, works of mercy, and service. As I, I, th I thought it was great that you brought up, Mark brought up in the, in the leadership talk about service. What does Jesus say? The greatest among you is a servant of all. The more gifts you have, the more you're required to offer that for the kingdom of God. If every, every one of our actions should be one of two things. Work for the salvation of souls, or to glorify God. 
it's not one of those things, then don't do it. It's real easy. Okay? We're required, if you have gifts and you're not using those, the parent of the talents. Lord gives it all different gifts. And this doesn't have to be a spirit. You don't have to be a, a preacher. Um, that's why I like doing this, this security. I was telling some guys, guys have military skills. All right? Those are very valuable skills that the church is dying for right now. Right? Use those gifts. Having the team that we put together, is, I see more spiritual fruit than actually the physical fruit of protecting the churches. Getting guys involved. Getting camaraderie. A lot of guys think on the military, they never don't know what this is like, but the guys are craving this stuff. So now we fight together. We were not done our patron saint. We were a little lapel pin for our patron saint. And uh, it's just really beautiful to see guys come together and then experience it to a, a little lesser, you know, it's not like the military, but this camaraderie. And, but really, hey, if I'm not working, I'm, my kids are, I'm trusting these guys who are working. My, my, I'm trusting less of my family to them. Okay? And vice versa. So it, it's very important. Um, and especially the millennials, so let us say the 20, 30 olds to get a, a single male to do anything in the church is like pulling teeth. I pray if you can get a guy to do something, like that's a major accomplishment. Because of this technology, this instant gratification, we're so obsessed, this social media is designed to create a narcissist. And waste as much of your time as possible. That's one of the former creators of uh, Facebook came out, he broke away and he said, we designed this to waste as much of your time as possible. That's evil. People were kindling affairs because they're connecting with all these people. It, this is really, I, I say it's a satan. You can be so a little bit of good in that. You can connect with people. Ministering through that is, is a waste. You do more harm than good. You need to be face to face with somebody. Look at uh, what Andrew said so beautifully. He said, Andrew, about looking the, so, at somebody in the eyes and being honest with them. That's, that's what changes people, not a post on the internet and then somebody does something horrible and, kind of, and then, then gets people angry and upset. It's just, it just disturbs their peace. Get off the of social media, guys. Get on and talk to somebody. All right, so do a little inventory, kind of see if you stack them in those things. There's a lot more you can go into, but I could keep a little bit short for the talk. So that's what we're, our goals are. So we know we have the duty to defend. Um, now we got to know the enemy, right? And, the, and when, they, when they took out uh, Bin Laden, the special force team, they had, they, they had some obviously satellite surveillance. They, they had a, uh, they knew the structure that he was staying at that compound. They built a replica of that. These guys would actually go through it so much, they would actually blindfold and they knew how many steps it was to get to the stairwell, how many steps it was, and then where they were at, how the whole layout was done. So that in the dark, they could go every, over and over and over and over again. Okay, <coughs> They know the enemy better than, you know, just so well. They, they study this, the, their, all the people, who's, who is this person on the compound, what's their sleeping habits, you know, who has authority here. So you have to know the enemy inside out. And today, uh, even in the seminaries, they're not training, before in the old days, every priest was training the right of exorcism. Now you got one, one person per diocese, and sometimes it's just a bishop. Every bishop is, uh, has, a, has the authority to do exorcism, most of the time they delegate it to somebody else. I highly recommend you write this down, Father Chad Ripperger. R I P P E R G E R. Go on YouTube to put his name in, all stuff will come up. This guy's a this priest is amazing. The level of information you get, it's basically like a seminary education. He gives you he's a Thomist, Thomas Aquinas. He has talks to all matters to spiritual life, but he really gets into the demonic. So what I'm gonna be talking about is basically what he you can get those on yourself in those videos. Get educate yourself, guys. All right. Where do the temptations come from? Three places. Call it out. Memory. 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 No. Well. Devil. Well, kind of. But that's like bit. Yeah, bigger. The devil. What's the other one? Flesh. 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 Right. Those are the three main sources of temptations that come to us. The role. Sometimes we're just exposed to things, but we have to do. We have a duty not to put ourselves in occasions of sin. But sometimes you drive around, you see a billboard. You know, an immodest billboard. Um, so we have to learn how to deal with that. Uh, the flesh, we all have concupiscence, and depending on our temperament, we have different things we struggle with, okay? So the, 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 uh, those can create an issue for us, we have to work on that, and obviously devil through temptations, and we're gonna get how these interplay, okay? You have to understand the three main sources of, of uh, temptations. Okay, this is very important to understand what the demons have access to and what they don't. They have access to your, your memory and your imagination. They don't, they don't know your thoughts. It's, it's kind of weird because how the, 
the psychology of it, the mind is it's, it's just full, totally fascinating. I've been really studying a lot of psychology lately. Um, they, they can't touch your will. They cannot force you to do anything. They can, it's like leading a, a horse to water. Like, they can lead you places, but you have to give the authority to commit that sin. They can make it really, 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 really hard, but you have the ultimate will. God will not let them touch your will. Now, memory and imagination. Anything you've ever seen or done is stored deep down here somewhere. I have a bad memory. Like, <laughs> I have a wife gets frustrated with me sometimes. She'll so tell me something, and I'll forget what she said, or I'll bring it up later, and she's like, well, we were just talking about that. And so it just came up in my head. So I have a bad memory. But anything that's stored down doesn't mean it's not in my memory, because I can't think about it consciously. So I'm sure all of you have experienced this. Maybe you're praying the rosary. Maybe you're doing an hour of adoration. And all of a sudden, bam, this like impure thought pops in your head. Or maybe at work, I work, I do numbers, and you know, I'm an accountant, and uh, very dry stuff. And all of a sudden, somehow these horrible temptations come in. It's like that's a demon, that's a demon attacking you. Now it's different than if you're sitting around and see a beautiful woman, and you start looking at her, and then well, she looks, you know, and your mind starts going, that that's you, you've done that, okay? But if something comes out of the blue like that, or some memory, like whoa, where did that happen from? You've given them armor to torment you. There's a, actually just, from what I understand it was real, uh, in a couple centuries, there's a, there's a desert monk. And he had to go into town for something. And just happened to see a beautiful woman. She wasn't in monster, just a really beautiful woman walk by. When you're in this desert, there's nothing. You're around rocks. Okay? A beautiful woman walked by. And he said the devil tempted him for 40 years with the image of that woman. So guys, you're going to watch porn, you just give the demons a whole bunch of stuff to play with. Uh, girls you've sinned with and uh, in impurity, they can call that up any time. They also have access to your bodies. They can stimulate your sexual passions. They can cause illnesses. They can make you feel good. That's what temptation is, right? It stimulates you and it your sexual passions or just your carnal appetites. That's why we, it's really important to keep custody of our senses. Okay? So it's understanding how it's really important that we understand how that how what they have influence on and what they don't. A lot of people don't know even voices, and you know that's we'll get into a little bit later. Um, we're going to go into different levels of uh, satanic attack. I'm not going to go too into this in the interest of time, but uh, uh, what you're seeing today is there's a huge huge issue of obsession, demonic obsession, and it's basically an obsessive thought you cannot get out of your head. Uh, a lot of anxiety, depression, um, actually uh, bipolar is a demonic issue completely. Um, uh, OCD, and if it's something little like I have to walk around my car five times before I can leave, otherwise I, I just like, that's a demonic thing getting us and it's an obsessive disorder. But bipolar is basically, you see these massive changes in personality, because basically, the de demons don't have to like constantly be on you. They might, the, what this bipolar is, that they'll come in, they'll influence you, and you almost become like a different person. The demons will get influence them and just take them to all these extremes, and all of a sudden, then they'll let them go, and then they kind of come back. And it's really like a different person. It's really crazy. But uh, this is the most common thing that, uh, especially really serious in the, in the spiritual life, uh, these temptations of thought are probably the hardest to deal with. Uh, like I said, you know, I don't have TV. I don't listen to secular music. Um, but the demons still have access to this up here. So even if you've done everything you can possibly do to guard yourself, it doesn't mean you're, they're not going to get you. So, uh, and part of that was God, like God gave St. Paul a thorn in the flesh to torment him, to keep him humble. Okay? So we have to be very careful about that. And this is, you write this down, this is, this is one of these big weapons, these uh, top secret weapons in the spiritual life that almost very few people know about, including priests. And Father Ripper got to talk about this where I've heard it from, so it's coming from a legit source. It's, it's, a, it's called a spiritual contract. Or maybe like a habitual intention. You don't need a priest to do it. I didn't wear it to, to the. I have a religious ring as a Benedict uh, um, medal on it. You can make a spiritual contract with God, and what you can do, you can attach prayers to an either an object or like an action that you do. Um, I, I I prefer that the actions because you're actually doing something. For example, um, we'll get into later where the demons can actually like basically make your mind go blank. Um, so, so you can do a prayer. So I, I said to God, when I kiss this ring, I'm really getting assaulted. I can make this contract. I have about probably a half hour's worth of spiritual, very powerful prayers attached to this when I, when I enact this. 
if it's so, uh, when I can't even think about what I'm doing, I can do this for some temptations, and then all these prayers are enacted. You, you do this, I wish to make a personal attention. When I do this action, and you, you do it the fully one time, and you can call upon that in the future. And it's, it's so powerful, and it, that's really limited to your faith, how, how big you want to go. So I actually do, if I'm getting tempted by sin of the flesh, I actually offer for uh, purity for the world, chastity for the world. Uh, pray for the soul of salvation, of those, if they choose to tell me with a person, for that soul. Okay? And I nut it to the scourging at the pillar. When you feel like your flesh is being just raped by the demons and trying to get you to sin in the soul and <coughs> stuff. So, very, very, very powerful stuff. Real quick, infestation, that's just, you know, hauntings. Uh, they can be attached to uh, stuff that's cursed objects. You can have some demonic activity. Uh, possession, we're not going to talk about too much. It's very rare. Acting in some really strange ways. That's because their will is not... Uh, does not want the possession, but the demons are acting. So what you see a lot today is perfect possession. And that's what basically like a Satanist, where their will is perfectly united to evil. So there's no battle in the soul to get rid of the demons. They're perfectly united to that. A lot of the, the most powerful Satanists are not these like heavy metal guys or this guys that do the public masses. Those are just, they're still Satanists, but they're kind of like one of these. The most powerful ones are the billionaires they're doing some very horrible things, or like those promoting funding abortion, trying to uh, contraception, putting poisons in our food and such. Those are the, the really powerful evil uh, people. They're perfectly united to, to Satan himself. Um, the prayer group I'm in, uh, write this down. Um, now, this is not for everybody, okay? You need to discern this. It actually says you should consult a priest before joining us. Unfortunately, most priests don't even know about it. Uh, it's a prayer group called Exilium Christianorum, it's Latin. Or you can get an app. I recommend the cell phone app. It's, it's free. Um, what it is, is it's a prayer group that supports exorcists in our ministries. But as a member, you get very, very powerful spiritual protection for yourself, your family, friends, and those who pray for you. It's recommended for those experiencing extraordinary demonic activity. Uh, if you're in the pro-life movement, you're doing sidewalk counseling, great for law enforcement officers around all kind of crazies. So if you're in the battle in the trenches, it's very highly recommended. Now, uh, one of the, the there's no formal... Uh, registration, or you don't pay money, you just make, and so the requirements are, you have to commit to a daily rosary, uh, devotion to St. Michael, um, and if you're struggling, with, uh, currently struggling with falling into mortal sin and an habitual nature, this, do not do this group, okay? If you decide to join this group, don't, don't for a couple weeks or so, and then say, oh, I'm done, I don't think this anymore. You really have to discern this, because they will, they will pound you if you stop the demons. This is very, very serious. But the prayers, we're going to close with one of the prayers. Um, it's basically like being the special forces of God's army. When you, when you read these prayers, they're very powerful binding prayers and different things. Amazing. It's all in the power of our ladies and the conception to press Satan. So we know the demons are out there. What do we need to do in our daily lives, okay? We have a responsibility, Catechism 2265. The legitimate self-defense cannot only be a right, but a grave duty for one who's responsible for the lives of others. And it's both, there's a, a corporal and a, a spiritual realm of that. So we are responsible. So there's a, 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 the things in uh, one of the scripture verses, Matthew 18, 6. But he that shall scandalize one of these little ones that believeth in me, it were better for him that a millstone be hung around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Think about that. Have we ever scandalized our kids by what's on the TV? Have we ever let them be scandalized by the, the music they're listening to? Or even our actions? That's some pretty tough words. We have to put our house on lockdown. One of the things we need to do, actually there's a, a, a mystic back in, uh, I think it was early 1800s, uh, she saw the Satan in a box. And this is before TVs came about. Mm. Even watching football on Sunday, nothing wrong with football in itself, but if you're watching football with your kids and these like cheerleaders are in like, half dressed around shaking their watching the beer commercials where they're promoting fornication, uh, debauchery, all these mortal sins, you're scandalizing your kids, guys. I'm sorry, it is it is what it is. Social media, no mail. Guys, watch, watch the magazines. There's all kind of I have a hiking magazine, I had to go rip out of these pages for these ads with girls in some for rocks and bikinis. I mean, it's horrible. Um, you want to keep uh, Custody the eyes and senses. Watch what comes in and out. Okay, eyes. Uh, so this is where we sin. The five senses, touch being one of them. We gotta guard those and put them on lockdown. Real quick, everybody. The handout I have, the rule of life. 
They talk about being a disciplined soldier, right? If we're not in recommend the life that has accountability, we're, we're not going to be too effective. This is a stripped down version. Uh, I don't even kids should be doing some of these things. Morning offering and get up, offer the dice, uh, trials, all your good works uh, to the, obviously you can ask to offer to the Sacred Heart, to the Immaculate Heart. We do that morning offering. Our priest says, do three Hail Marys for purity. Okay, when you get up. Mortifications, do we lose five little mortifications a day? Uh, when the saints say, you should never leave the table wanting something. Or you should always leave the table wanting something with food. Maybe you don't put salt on your food. Maybe you don't have dessert. Okay, maybe a fast meal, whatever. Um, do you need to take a hot sour all the time? Do you need to do a lukewarm, maybe a little colder sour, right? Little things you can do. We're not talking about, you know, extreme fasting and different things that the saints did. Do something to discipline yourself. Uh, gird your weapons right here. Right? Right here. I always have two weapons on me unless it's prohibited by the civil authorities. I got my rosary and some kind of weapon, okay? Um, real quick, on, on the rosary, the rosary and the scapular are prophesied in the battle of David and Goliath, okay? Satan represents this Satan himself. He had this young lad who was called out, strong faith. And then, so this links back to Genesis 3.15. God's, after the fall, God just said to Satan, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. She will crush your head, and you will lie in wait of her heel. Okay, going back to the story about David and Goliath. What did he have? What kind of weapon did he have? Five smooth stones. Right. And, and actually, it says smooth stones. In the old days, before we had this chain form of the rosary, the peasants used to carry round pebbles in their pockets. And they would do 150 Hail Marys in honor of the 50 songs, because they were in the monastic and do the, the songs. Um, so the spokesman are related to these pebbles. And then the, days, the slingshots they have are not this, this type of slingshot. It's with the two long straps. They would throw it and hold one of them, the other hand would go out. They would carry it around their necks like the scaffold when they, when they traveled. Okay? And who knows how David, uh, David killed Goliath? Where did he, how did he kill him? He crushed his head, didn't he? Some estimate, some of the fossilized that the five round stones represent the five large beads of the, the rosy our fathers, or the five mysteries, you know. Uh, but if you look at it, so she said, they said, so who is Mary's seed? Sacred scripture defines things. So Revelation 12, at the end of the chapter, is how woman behold the sun, comes to the sun, the moon under her feet, and this dragon comes and tries to attack her. And it says she went, she went in the wilderness, and Satan went about trying to destroy her seed, and it defines it. Those who keep the commandments and hold fast the testimony of Christ. Gentlemen, we are her seed. God has put enmity between the woman and, and Satan. This is an eternal enmity God has instilled. The spiritual battles are ladies. If you don't understand that, you miss the whole thing. Okay? Yes, Christ has the power to crush Satan, but that was delegated to Mary herself because it humiliates Satan. A woman is more powerful uh, than him and more knowledgeable. So it's very powerful that this is our main spiritual weapon that we have when we pray it. Uh, Padre Peel said, bring me my weapon in his rosaries. Moving on. So, pray that daily rosary. Gird your weapons. Always have them with you. Even our priest said that even the young boys should always have a pocket knife. It really changes. When you have something like this on it, it changes who you are. So, psychologically. It's very, very powerful. Because the ascensities train. You should have some kind of physical fitness program. And I always, I'm really big on some kind of fighting art. <clears throat> Could just be a, a, a boxing, a punching bag you're hanging from your tree in your backyard. Get your kids hit in the bag, exercise, take a martial arts defense class, uh, shoot a gun, do something, okay? It, it's part of our warrior mindset that we need to do and foster. We should be praying a family rosary. This is where guys really fall short, even guys that do pray the rosary, a lot of them, they do it privately. I can't tell you how healing it is and to see the changes in people's lives when you get together as family and pray that rosary together. It's so powerful. And the last one is examination of conscience before you go to bed. We actually do the examination of our fa uh, family before we do the rosary. Uh, but you can do it however you want. Do an inventory that day. Do a post mortem, they call it, and if you're in business or in the military. Something went wrong that day, what went wrong? What, you know, how, do, how do I get better? You know, keep your soul clean before you go to bed. Uh, I'll go and close uh, with a quote and then a prayer. St. Bernard of Clairvaux actually uh, wrote the will of life for the Knights Templar. He said, a Templar knight 
is truly a fearless knight, secure on every side, for his soul is protected with the armor of faith, just as his body is protected with the armor of steel. He is thus doubly armed, and neither fear nor demons nor men. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to become, guys. I'm going to close with a prayer from the Exilium Christian Orm. Nomine Pacta Filii Spiritui Sancti. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, we ask thee to render all spirits impotent, paralyzed, and effective in attempting to take revenge against us, our families, friends, communities, those who pray for us, and their family members or anyone associated with us and our priests. That's the group. We ask thee to bind all evil spirits, all powers in the air, the water, the ground, the fire, underground, or wherever they exercise their satanic powers and forces in nature, and any and all emissaries of the satanic headquarters. We ask thee to bind by thy precious blood all the attributes, aspects, and characteristics, interactions, communications, and deceitful games of the evil spirits, especially those trying to attack our families. We ask thee to break any and all bonds, ties, curses, and attachments. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. amen.